Damn, I'm too greedy. It must have been those last two million. I should have just let them go. I felt that something was wrong with this account. They're getting closer, but they seem to think I don't know anything. This should buy me some time. I still had a chance to escape and make sure they couldn't track me any further. Fortunately, I had a plan for this case. The question of who I am and who is trying to track me down does not matter now because this person is on the verge of complete disappearance. In two hours, I will take on a completely new appearance. The trail the pursuers are following will lead them to a dead end before they gather enough information to identify me. As for who I am or will soon become, I am a hacker, and a very experienced one at that. I have a specific list of targets, criminal cartels. I carefully monitor their financial activities and discreetly hand over the evidence to the appropriate authorities. Personally, I contributed to the prosecution of four politicians, at least 50 law enforcement officers, a dozen soldiers in different countries, and many small-time dealers. In addition, I withdrew more than $100 million from their accounts, a significant part of which was directed to various charitable purposes, particularly rehabilitation programs. Why, you ask? Simply put, my younger sister got involved with the wrong crowd. I strongly disapproved of her choice of partner, but she ignored my warnings. Despite my attempts to protect her after the death of our parents, she made her own decisions. In the two dreary years I spent in seclusion after discovering what was left of her body, my computer skills went from skillful to almost extraordinary. Secluded in the basement of our family home, I immersed myself in dark secrets and mastered the art of manipulation. After discovering vulnerabilities in numerous security systems, I came across defamatory information about a gang of criminals responsible for the torment and death of my sister, who eventually ended up in the department combating illegal substances. Rival gangs received information that this gang was using government evidence against others to make a deal. Because gangs were quickly outpacing law enforcement, the government saved a significant amount on legal costs. The people who were chasing me were hired by a criminal clan from whom I freed about $30 million. Looking back, I should have settled for $28 million, but my curiosity led me to another smaller account. Even though I felt that something was wrong, my young, foolish, and still offended self persisted. As the funds passed through 40 accounts in six countries, my anti-hacking software began to sound the alarm. A tracking program was built into the account, which tried to identify the source of the hack. Figuring out the origin of the attack turned out to be a tedious process involving sifting through numerous IP addresses and bypassing servers. After inserting the flash drive, I performed a sequence of keystrokes and mouse clicks, effectively cutting off the tracks leading to me. The dilapidated building in which I lived was engulfed in flames, a wandering bonfire that got out of control. The flames burned hard drives, memory cards, and personal documents to a crisp, making it impossible to save any information. After ensuring it was impossible to extract information from the charred remains, I drove west and arrived in Las Vegas four days later. Five years have passed. Faced with computer problems, I turned to my wife, Linda, for help. Seriously, Mark, how can a 25-year-old guy be so bad with computers? She teased, giving me a quick kiss on the top of my head. After a few clicks and keystrokes, I resumed checking my email. Dinner will be ready in half an hour, she informed me before returning to the kitchen. It's been two years since Linda and I tied the knot. I considered myself incredibly lucky, leaving my old life behind. I rebuilt myself and got a job as a truck driver at a local sawmill. Since there was a trade union at the shipyard, the salary was quite decent. Carefully withdrawing some funds from an offshore account, I bought a modest three-bedroom house on a plot. I built a secluded building on the property, a kind of shelter next to the house, to use as a store and warehouse. I also added a secret room to restore and update the computer system. It was a small walkthrough storeroom with a raised floor leading to stairs underground. It looked like an ordinary concrete floor. I decided to stop chasing dealers for a while. I had enough money stashed away in case I needed it, and it was wise to disappear and let everything cool down. I didn't want to lose my skills and I needed to keep up with new technologies. The store was created for my hobby of assembling old cars. My wife was completely uninterested in this, so she never entered my store. It also gave me time and privacy to go online and play a little. 
you may be wondering why I'm hiding this from her. The fact is, she knows me as a simple mechanic and truck driver who knows almost nothing about computers. When I met her and we started dating, I couldn't just reveal that I was a hacker named Ghost in the computer underground. First of all, the feds were looking for me for committing several cyber crimes, and they also wanted to lock me up and use my skills for their own purposes. Secondly, there were very dangerous criminal organizations, and I was on their target list. If they had caught me, my end would have been very ugly and extremely painful. How long would our relationship last after that? There were a few more things we needed to do after the wedding. This was done for her own safety. If she didn't know, they wouldn't be able to use her to get information. No, it's better that she only knows the man she married. So, a little bit about my wife. First of all, for me, she is the most beautiful woman on the planet. I always read in these stories that every woman is always the most beautiful on the planet, and I wonder how there can be more than one. I'm not going to lie to you, she may be above average to you, but to me, she's a goddess. Different points of view and different strokes, wavy copper bronze hair to the middle of the back, emerald green eyes, a small waist with a flat tummy, slightly wide hips, long slender tanned legs. She had a thin nose, prominent cheekbones, dimples that appeared when she smiled, plump inviting lips, and a modest but not overly pronounced chin. But how did we cross paths? I was working at the sawmill one afternoon when she showed up. She was looking for a pair of shelf boards for her new apartment, and we discussed her choice. During our conversation, she mentioned that she didn't know how to handle tools. I offered to visit her after work and help with the installation of shelves. After the installation, dinner turned into dancing the next evening. I'm sorry, but there are no juicy stories here. The evening ended with a simple affectionate peck on the cheek. The truth was that I had a deep-rooted fear of women. Let me tell you more about this. When I extorted a substantial sum from the cartel, I was a skinny 19-year-old guy and a computer nerd who had never had any intimate relationships before. Since I moved to Las Vegas, my intimate adventures had been limited to three meetings with girls of easy virtue. The first meeting was not very impressive, robotic communication in the back seat of my car on Fremont Street. The subsequent visit took place at a brothel in Parm, where the companions showed a semblance of care. The third date also took place in the same brothel, this time, armed with sufficient funds, I spent the whole night with a professional, trying to learn the art of pleasing women. Now, I was romantically involved with a woman I admired. We only started intimacy on the fifth date. Our evening started with dinner at the Stratosphere, after which we went to a lively dance club on the Strip. After pampering ourselves with expensive food soaked in wine and having a few drinks during a two-hour dance session at the club, we headed back to my apartment. At first, she seemed beautiful to me, but then she turned into an unearthly creature. The damp sheets indicated that she was pleased and allayed my fears. As long as she was happy, I was happy. It seems that the lessons taught by the previous companion had left an indelible mark. A year dedicated to sports and hard work also increased my muscle mass and endurance, getting my physique in shape. Despite the fact that I considered myself a nerd, I didn't pay attention to my physique in trousers. I considered myself average, although the girls praised my size. I courted Linda for about six months before I proposed to her, and six months later, we exchanged vows. Our union brought satisfaction and joy. She worked as an accountant for a large national company with an office in Las Vegas. She earned good money there, and combined with our incomes, we lived quite comfortably. I've never had to dip into my secret accounts. We went to the best restaurants, watched shows, went boating on the lake, and both drove nice cars. Our intimate life was very good, on average, we met about four times a week. We haven't had any children yet, so our lovemaking took place all over the house, backyard, pool, and jacuzzi. We enjoyed the variety. Usually, after coming home from work, I would go to my workshop and tinker around for a couple of hours before dinner. I spent about half of my time working on one of my machines and the other half in the room playing on the computer. I didn't really do anything wrong, I just went where I shouldn't have. In fact, I didn't take anything or alter any systems, I was just maintaining my skills. Of course, I could have stolen a lot of data and money, but I didn't want to leave any traces. After dinner, we would sit on the couch and watch a movie before going to bed. 
Sometimes, we made love in bed for hours before falling asleep. I continued to demonstrate my complete technological incompetence. After all, who would look at a man who can barely check his email and assume he is one of the most wanted hackers in the world? During this time, I've been hacking into the computer systems of banks, governments, and large companies. I also reconfigured my army of personal computer bots. I located my position by initiating hacks from foreign servers, sometimes using multiple servers simultaneously. About six months ago, I noticed that Linda had become a bit more tense, although it didn't seem like a big problem at the time. Our lovemaking decreased from about four times a week to two. She started working longer hours and would come home tired. Most of the time, she would go straight to the shower, have dinner, and then go to bed. When I asked her about it, she mentioned something about a large project at work they were trying to finalize. It seemed plausible. From time to time, Linda called me from her workplace on Fridays to tell me about plans to spend time with colleagues after work. It became a common occurrence and eased all my worries. About six months later, I inquired about the duration of these outings, assuming they should have concluded by now. Linda replied that it would probably be another week or two before things settled down. Deciding she deserved to be pampered a little for her hard work, I surprised her with a full-day spa package for the coming Saturday. On Wednesday evening, after receiving the gift, she was delighted with the gesture. She expressed her gratitude to me, and we found solace in each other's company. On Saturday, she left for the spa at 9 a.m., kissing me goodbye before she departed. After waiting for her return until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I drank my coffee and then went to the workshop to continue working on the engine project. After an hour, I took a break and retired to my computer room. Up to this point, I had refrained from hacking into Linda's computer. It was a cardinal rule to mind your own business, and I firmly adhered to this principle, avoiding any interference in the affairs of the company where we worked. After checking the security of my systems, curiosity aroused my interest in a mysterious large account. It seemed like it might be time to investigate further and examine their servers. Their security measures were simple, and I gained access quickly. The first destination was Linda's computer, where she worked on the project. This could provide valuable information. To my surprise, there was nothing exceptional about the new important clients. A search for relevant keywords did not yield significant results. While rummaging through the folders, I came across a closed file marked Photos for James. Why would Linda need a folder with photos of this man? I was well acquainted with James, having crossed paths with him at corporate events that Linda attended. Despite the fact that Linda was skilled with computers, I easily opened the folder. Its contents amazed me, there were many naked photos of Linda taken in her office. In the photos, she was depicted in an intimate relationship with another man, shown in various positions. What struck me the most were the photographs depicting intimate acts which she had consistently refused with me. As I sat staring blankly at the candid pictures, some part of me seemed to wither. Eventually, I came back to reality, thinking about the impending confrontation after her return. The decision to divorce this deceitful woman had already been made. With just a few hours remaining until her arrival, I plunged into the investigation, continuing to search for new clues tracing the changes in her behavior that began about six months ago. When I looked into her email, I made a startling discovery. The correspondences testified to a long-standing affair that had started a year before our relationship began. The question arose, why would she enter into a relationship with me if she was already involved with someone else? What had really happened? Another letter hinted at accounting discrepancies between her significant clients and their company, mentioning an offshore account. Turning my attention to James's computer, I found even more incriminating photos of Linda. Some showed her in a motel room, others hinted at a relationship in another man's bedroom. Realizing I needed more time to collect evidence, I started copying data from both computers and directories on the company's network to a secure disk on my server. Before disconnecting from the network, I installed spyware on their systems and server, directing all their actions to my computer. This temporarily distracted me from my automotive projects. When Linda returned from the spa, she expressed her gratitude with a passionate night of intimacy. Despite my contempt for her actions, the temptation to be with a beautiful and enthusiastic partner was undeniable. She might be the epitome of deception, but I couldn't resist the opportunity to enjoy myself. 
As Sunday approached, I returned to my store, reflecting on the disturbing revelations. While Linda slept, I took the opportunity to access her phone and discreetly installed spyware. This program was intended to secretly copy text messages to my computer system, record all phone conversations on a separate hard drive, and monitor her online activities. Linda left around 10 o'clock in the morning, saying she was meeting a friend for a shopping trip. Since the Find My Friends app on her phone was disabled, I resorted to hacking her car's internal GPS system to track her movements. Surprisingly, she actually went to the mall. After making sure she wouldn't return quickly, I took her laptop first. I duplicated all the data to another hard drive, then installed the keylogger program and set up the camera for remote access. Realizing there was little time left before her return, I quickly scanned her browser history. During this search, I came across a second email address and noticed several visits to a bank in the Cayman Islands, which I intended to explore in more detail. After washing off all traces of grease and oil from my hands and face to maintain the appearance of working on the car, I heard Linda coming home. She took a shower, we had dinner, watched a movie, and went to bed. For the next week, I masqueraded as a forgetful, loving husband. Every evening, I went to the workshop to supposedly tinker with one of my cars for a couple of hours. In reality, I had been examining the numerous data accumulated during this time. One Tuesday evening, my interest was piqued by a conversation between Linda and James. James warned her about the need to clear my laptop's history after use. Why would she need my laptop? Although I had set up my laptop to connect to servers when I bought it, the idea that I might accidentally spy on myself did not occur to me. The next evening, as I was reviewing updates from their work computers, a new data stream caught my attention, money transfers. Turning on the laptop's camera, I redirected the data stream to another screen where Linda was working on a computer with a Bluetooth device in her ear. The microphone recorded her voice during the conversation, and I initiated a live broadcast of the phone conversation on the third screen, carefully watching and listening to Linda's actions following James' instructions. They transferred about $50,000 from a fictitious account in their company to a bank in the Cayman Islands, using my computer for that. Soon, she finished her work, deleted the history for that day, and logged out. What's going on here? I haven't had time to look at my personal files yet, and then I find out that I've been appointed as a computer security consultant. James obviously hired me because he was the head of their IT department. I also discovered several payments for my services, all of them, of course, were transferred to an account in the Cayman Islands. I was unknowingly hired as a computer security consultant. Linda and James used my computer and IP address to transfer large amounts of money from a fake account in their company to an offshore bank. Moreover, Linda and James had an affair even before I met Linda. I began to realize that I was being dragged into something. It was time to switch gears. Now that I understood what was going on, I needed to figure out how bad it was and what to do about it. Everything was bad. When I checked the account in the Cayman Islands, I saw that there was almost $10 million in it. Checking the transactions, I saw that they occurred about six months after Linda and I got married. They tried to obscure which computer the money was stolen from. In addition, digging deeper into my personal files, you would find several alarming signals. Yes, when everything went wrong, I was in the affected area. So, what should I do now? Surprisingly, it wasn't so difficult to act normally next to this situation. Now, I needed a revenge plan. I started organizing everything. First, I opened several new bank accounts. Then, I activated the army of bots I had created. Most of the bot army would be a distraction, but I had one small group that could be traced, though it wouldn't be easy. Only a very skilled hacker would be able to trace it back to the source. Of course, I deleted the folder with the staff and my name from Linda's company servers. I also hacked and changed all the files transferred from my laptop so that they showed a different IP address. To prevent this from happening again, I ran a very nasty virus on my laptop and then disconnected it from my secret servers. Later in the evening, when I went to check my mail, I discovered that a virus had attacked my laptop from the spam I had opened and had practically destroyed it. I wasn't surprised by the concern on Linda's face when she saw what had happened. The next morning, I saw a text exchange between Linda and James. Apparently, they had almost finished their scam. 
They wanted to make two more transfers to get another $10 million and then trap me. The plan was for Linda to suddenly discover the theft. Since she would be the only one to discover it, she would investigate. James, as head of the Information Technology Department, would lead the cyber part of the investigation. It was clear that everything would lead straight to me. Linda, of course, would file for divorce while I was in prison. About a year later, she would marry James. There would be suspicions about Linda's possible involvement, but she would refer to her investigation and claim that I must have hidden my knowledge of computers from her. It would be obvious that she was a victim since I specifically chose her to gain access to the company's computer systems. They both laughed at the thought that I would try to answer questions about where the money went when I had no idea what the police were talking about. Linda also said she would buy me a new laptop and that they would be able to make the final transfers within the next three weeks. Now that I knew how long I would last, I told my boss on Monday that I needed a week off to resolve personal issues. I had a lot of free time, so it wasn't a problem. I did a little research on the internet to find the dirtiest, most effective ways to take down. They thought they had three weeks, but they'd be lucky if they lasted two. When I got home, I turned on my computer and got to work. I logged into James's home computer. If you were an information technology specialist, you'd think he'd be smart enough to turn it off when he's not using it. No, he just turned off the monitor. I redirected his computer through a server in Switzerland, but eventually, the connection was erased. His computer would be a dead end for anyone trying to find him. Having formed an alliance with the cartel five years ago, I learned valuable security lessons from this experience. Although they had updated their accounts and passwords, their dependence on the same banks remained a vulnerability. Fresh passwords were useless if they were stored on personal computers exposed to phishing software often embedded in email links. Luring multimillionaires with coveted goods was only the initial stage before I started working with James. I intended to complete the business with Linda. James wouldn't have passed the test, but I still needed him to pass Linda. Following my routine, I retired to the workshop to tinker with the car. Linda suddenly went to Walmart to buy a new laptop for me. During her absence, I prepared the basis for the upcoming plan. It was necessary that she be at home while working on the computer to negate any alibi. When she returned, she informed me about the purchase and her intention to set it up, expecting it to take an hour. After expressing my gratitude to her, I began to complete the task. First of all, I broke off all ties with James. Despite my contempt for Linda, I didn't want to hurt her. If James was facing a grim fate, then Linda would most likely serve time in prison. Using a special server route, I got direct access to Linda's laptop, established a connection to her work computer, and then to the company's servers. After that, $20 million was transferred from the company to four accounts in her name, and then her trips were organized. On Thursday morning, a one-way ticket was purchased for her trip to the Cayman Islands. Before I left the computer, I deleted James from my contacts, erased all correspondence, and cleared my account history. After removing all the spyware, I risked disconnecting from her laptop and then turned off the wireless router in the house. I had the best one available, which she didn't know about. A message from the spyware on her phone showed that she had finished setting up the laptop for me at just the moment when the internet went missing. While she was trying to use my computer for another data transfer, I took the opportunity to transfer the stolen money to new accounts in Linda's name. As soon as the account was emptied, I closed it and deleted the spyware from her phone to cover my tracks. Satisfied with my work, I went to dinner, looking forward to an interesting day. The next morning, Linda nervously informed me that the internet was down. Unaware of how easily I would handle the situation, she looked preoccupied all evening. I wasn't surprised by the concern on Linda's face when she saw what had happened. The next morning, I awaited a meeting with the lawyer, curious about how Linda's day had gone. When I met the lawyer, I was struck by her professional yet alluring demeanor, reminiscent of a character in a courtroom drama. Thanks to her striking appearance and captivating presence, she radiated confidence and charm that could conquer anyone. Watching her during the hearings, it became clear that in the courtroom, she had the tenacity of a barracuda, causing hearts in the courtroom to race. After ensuring confidentiality, I told her about my wife's infidelity and the elaborate setup. After describing in detail the scheme of embezzlement and deception, she asked how I uncovered these truths. I gave a vague explanation, avoiding the full truth. 
Admittedly, I exaggerated a little, explaining my awareness by the fact that I found evidence on my wife's laptop and mine was faulty. Desperate to get out of this marriage before the situation escalated, I turned to her for legal help and she agreed to take up the case. While she was preparing, I hesitated to file a lawsuit against my wife right away, preferring to wait and develop a more thoughtful plan. When I returned home, I resumed normal life but not without leaving spyware at Linda's workplace. The consequences of my actions manifested quickly, a major theft was uncovered, leading to an investigation in which the money was traced to Linda. Accusations poured in, and her involvement was undeniable. As the situation escalated, Linda was called to a critical meeting with the top management of the company, which was a turning point. Amid the chaos, the sudden arrival of law enforcement at my residence forced me to retreat to a secret room in the store. Disguising my actions as routine maintenance, wrapped in an atmosphere of mystery, I watched the unfolding events, ready for the next step. The police arrived in their standard uniforms, but the individuals who emerged from the SUVs wore windbreakers emblazoned with the word FBI, sparking my interest in their sudden visit. Skimming through the warrant before welcoming them into the house, I signaled my cooperation, as I had no secrets to hide. Putting on a concerned look, I gestured towards the computers, noting that they were likely interested in my wife's laptop since mine had been recently purchased and remained in use due to connection problems. After assuring them they could take whatever they needed, I pretended ignorance of the situation, emphasizing my lack of technical knowledge and suggesting they contact my wife or acquaintances. While escorted to the police station for questioning, I maintained my innocence, presenting myself as a simple truck driver with limited computer knowledge. Unfamiliar with my wife's professional activities as an accountant, I admitted ignorance about her clients and possible travel plans. During the interrogation, it became apparent I was not aware of the unfolding events. Despite a thorough search of my store, authorities failed to find a secret entrance to the computer room, and eventually, I was released. Meanwhile, Linda was arrested, and her accomplice James was compelled to testify against her, detailing her betrayal when she extorted money from him and fled the country, leaving him destitute. Anticipating scrutiny due to my marital ties, I arranged legal representation for Linda after her arrest, fulfilling my duty as her husband. As events unfolded, I remained on the periphery, navigating the complexities of the situation into which I unwittingly found myself drawn. Carefully researching all the criminal defense lawyers in the district, I aimed to provide the best legal representation for my wife's case, though my intentions were far from noble. Deliberately choosing a lawyer with slightly below average qualifications, my goal was for her to be convicted and serve the entire sentence without any chance of early release. Given the severity of the federal charges against her, I understood there would be no possibility of parole or early release based on good behavior in federal prisons. A federal sentence of 20 years meant serving the entire term behind bars without the possibility of reprieve. Attending her bail hearing, I used the house as collateral to secure her release, albeit with the condition of wearing a wrist monitor to prevent escape. Despite harboring resentment towards her, I maintained the appearance of a devoted husband in public, concealing my true feelings. Fortunately, her state of mind and shock deprived me of any hope of intimacy. Since her mobile phone was seized as evidence, I bought her a new one and discreetly brought it to her so she could stay in touch amidst her legal troubles. Upon receiving the first message, James quickly blocked her number, citing his need to act as a witness in her case. Despite this warning, she recklessly refused a plea bargain and insisted on going to trial, stubbornly defending her innocence and claiming she had been framed. Though she did not commit all the acts she was accused of, such as transferring all the money from the account, using her personal computer, buying a plane ticket, or firing an accomplice, she was found guilty. Despite denying her guilt, she faced conviction for her role in the embezzlement. The funds were easily recovered, which led to a comical trial from my point of view. As I watched James testify against her using computer recordings, I was torn between loyalty and betrayal. Throughout the process, Linda perceived betrayal on the part of her alleged betrothed, turning her love into resentment. Despite her attempts to defend herself on the witness stand, the overwhelming amount of evidence did not provide an acceptable explanation, resulting in a 20-year prison sentence. Once the trial was over, my attention shifted to James, against whom I hatched a sinister plan to ensure he remained unaware of my involvement in this venture. Taking decisive action, I instructed my lawyer to amend the divorce documents to reflect Linda's conviction and an extended prison term. 
A few days later, she received updated legal documents that marked the end of our tumultuous marriage. Creating new accounts in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Cayman Islands linked to James, I strategically planted faint traces on the dark web leading to his IP address. After a five-year hiatus, the ghosts of my past activities resurfaced, attracting attention from hacker communities. Presenting myself as an experienced hacker while leaving room for investigation, I meticulously studied ten servers across six countries, initiating an organized attack. Deploying an army of bots on the bank, I discovered and transferred targeted funds to James's accounts, observing the aftermath on the dark web. Subsequent attacks emptied additional accounts, accumulating $20 million in James's name. The hunt for the elusive criminal sparked a flurry of activity on hacker forums. Witnessing the mounting pressure, I contacted the bank again, transferred funds to a Swiss account, and erased all traces of my involvement, indifferent to the cartel taking the money. Turning my attention to a tracked bank account, I executed a $2 million transaction solely for the tracker's significance. Reflecting on my evasion tactics and associated risks, I awaited James's inevitable interrogation, observing his futile attempts to explain the mysterious transactions. Severing ties and removing all evidence, I prepared to extricate myself from the tangled web of deception, concluding a week of calculated maneuvers. As I converted my computer lab into a storage room and filed documents for purchasing real estate in Montana through an inconspicuous C corporation, news broke of James's sudden disappearance. His absence from work and the discovery of his abandoned car in the mall parking lot sparked concern and speculation about his whereabouts. Puzzled by the unfolding mystery, I returned to my business but was abruptly interrupted by a startling turn of events. Watching moving day pass, heralding the start of a new life after James's sudden departure over a month ago, news of his tragic death in Colombia cast a shadow over the day. His demise served as a stark reminder of the dangers lurking in the shadows. Deciding to disappear by day's end, I prepared to assume a new identity, discarding unnecessary belongings. After depositing my possessions in a vault in Denver and receiving an anonymous bank transfer, I found myself face to face with Linda, handcuffed and visibly upset. Observing her disheveled appearance in the harsh prison environment, I noted her concern, which deviated from her usual demeanor. During our tense conversation, Linda begged for help, insisting on her innocence and pleading for intervention in her crumbling marriage. Resolute in pursuing a divorce, I disregarded her pleas and revealed the dark fate that befell James in Colombia. Shocked by this revelation, Linda contemplated the consequences of James's alleged involvement in the criminal scheme. While Linda came to terms with the harsh reality, I urged her to accept the impending consequences, emphasizing the need to focus on her future despite her protests. Remaining steadfast in my determination, I realized the irreversibility of our path. Discussing the elusive hacker nickname The Ghost, I hinted at the consequences of aligning with dangerous adversaries, resonating with the grim walls of our meeting. As trackers approached, anticipating their arrival, I strategically feigned unconsciousness to slip away unnoticed. Shedding my former guise as the ghost, I embarked on a new chapter, abandoning underground activities and limiting my involvement in computer affairs to minor hacks for skill honing and technology maintenance. Maintaining the facade of a computer novice, I concealed my true capabilities, even from my once beloved wife. After two years of marriage, my world crumbled upon discovering my wife's deception and betrayal. Having exposed her infidelity and the carefully developed scheme with her lover to accuse me of embezzlement, I decided to take revenge on the insidious duo using my hacking skills. Carefully devising a plan to incriminate my wife, convince her lover of her infidelity, and manipulate events to put her in prison, I destroyed their once devoted bonds. When my wife's fate was sealed, I turned my gaze to her former lover, eager to avenge the deception and betrayal that had befallen me. Using my wife's lover's computer, I organized a break-in to siphon money from the cartel. Accidentally leaving a trail that led the authorities to the lover, which eventually led to his downfall and death. Story 2 Gray Penner was engrossed in Clive Cussler's latest novel, having reached page 125, when his attention was drawn by the sound of his wife's car pulling into the garage. Glancing at his Fitbit fitness watch, he noticed the time was 8.17 p.m. He couldn't help but notice, for the third time this week, his wife returning home late from work. It was a stark contrast to the first seven years of their marriage, when she was always punctual. Gray was not naive, 
he had noticed changes in her behavior. Initially, Kelly's calls about being late didn't bother him, but when she started coming home late with smudged lipstick and the scent of aftershave, he couldn't ignore these signs. That night, lying in bed, he gently stroked her neck, trying to decipher the unfamiliar scent left on her skin. He might not be an expert in fragrances, but he knew something was wrong. He was well aware of how distinctly the perfume he had given her contrasted with the intoxicating scent she actually exuded. Gray was stunned when his red-haired wife, still as stunning in her early thirties as the day they met in college, entered the room. His involuntary sigh was a familiar reaction whenever he looked at her after a short separation. Kelly couldn't help but smile at her husband's typical reaction, she knew it was a sincere compliment from him, and she admired that he still found her attractive so quickly after being in the presence of another man. Hi darling, she said, bending down to kiss him before heading upstairs. Her thin grin expressed both confidence and a note of superiority. Make yourself at home, I'll be down soon. Gray watched in silence as his wife entered the house and headed upstairs, seemingly oblivious to his presence. As he climbed the stairs, he couldn't help but notice the familiar smell of aftershave in the air. It wasn't the first time he had smelled it, and each time, it filled him with a sense of anxiety. He knew a confrontation was brewing that could either save his marriage or confirm his worst fears. Despite his doubts, Gray was sure that his wife had not yet crossed the line in her relationship with the charming Paco Rabin, a man whom he began to perceive as a threat. But he couldn't shake the feeling that she had come dangerously close. For seven years, Gray had feared that his wife might one day realize she deserved someone more attractive than him, someone like the mysterious Johan Van, who once tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden. Kelly, his wife, was a successful assistant vice president at an international telecommunications company, and Gray couldn't help but feel inferior in comparison. He didn't consider himself ugly, but he knew he could never match her beauty. Climbing to the top of the stairs, he prepared for the upcoming events, realizing that if he didn't take action soon, he could lose her forever. Johan, a 40-year-old blonde man from the Netherlands, had recently joined the company and quickly attracted the attention of his colleagues. Gray couldn't help but hear about Johan during the first few weeks of work, but Kelly, who initially shared details about Johan, suddenly became silent about him, which raised Gray's suspicions. One day during dinner, Gray couldn't contain his curiosity and asked Kelly about Johan. Kelly confirmed that Johan still worked in the office but noted they didn't communicate much because he was in another department. Sensing something was amiss, Gray noticed Kelly used to talk about Johan all the time, but now he seemed to have disappeared from their conversations. Kelly's face flushed slightly as she brushed off Gray's remark, saying they just didn't communicate much. Gray, noticing her awkwardness, realized she was lying to him. Soon, Kelly's behavior began to change. She started staying late at the office more often, and it became obvious she was attracted to Johan, a tall and attractive man. Despite her attempts to hide her feelings, his physical attractiveness and self-confidence, bordering on arrogance, drew her in. Johan, fluent in three languages and possessing dark blue eyes that seemed to see into Kelly's soul, knew exactly how to captivate her. Despite working in different departments, they often discussed work, and within a couple of weeks after Johan joined the company, they began having lunch together. Kelly loved her husband, but she didn't even realize a relationship was developing between her and Johan. Johan, on the other hand, subtly encouraged her, knowing Kelly was married but believing she would set boundaries if necessary. Extramarital affairs were not uncommon in his culture. Two weeks later, they found themselves working on a project they couldn't finish by the end of the day. Johan suggested returning to the project in the morning or staying in the office in the evening. Her smile indicated agreement. She quickly called Gray at the office and informed him of her delay. Gray noted that this was the first time she had been late in all the years they had worked together, but he did not object, since he himself was sometimes late. He offered to cook dinner that evening, she appreciated his concern. They left the office at 7 o'clock, even though they finished work around 6.30 p.m. Both didn't forget about the time. Staying up late became a familiar thing for the couple, starting with conversations and then moving on to physical caresses. Kelly knew she was walking a fine line, but she liked having both a husband and a boyfriend. She was so engrossed in her emotions that she either did not notice or did not attach importance to the fact that her husband was aware of what was happening. After college, 
Gray took a well-paid job at a local telecommunications company, and Kelly took a lower position at an international firm. They decided to postpone having children until the age of 30 and agreed that Kelly would get a master's degree in business online to advance her career. After Kelly received her master's degree, it was Gray's turn to move up the career ladder. Kelly quickly rose up the corporate ladder, receiving a promotion and a higher salary than her husband. Proud of his wife's success, Gray was pleased that their career plan was working but felt overshadowed by her achievements. Kelly, focusing on her own financial and personal goals, lost sight of their marital plan. When it was time for Gray to get his master's degree, Kelly offered to use the money to buy a house. Although Gray was disappointed that his dreams were put on hold, he realized how important it was to invest in their future family. Kelly always seemed to prioritize practical expenses over Gray's aspirations, making him hesitant about his own ambitions. He always met his wife's wishes because Kelly loved being the main earner and occupying the most important position in their relationship. She considered herself equal in their partnership. As Kelly walked down the stairs, butterflies danced in her stomach. She loved her husband, but she also desired Johan. She longed to be with him, to feel his presence and hug him after intimacy, but she couldn't betray her husband. She needed to be honest with him before anything happened. She knew he loved her and would most likely give her permission to do so for at least one weekend. Gray interrupted her thoughts by telling her that dinner was in the microwave and she only needed to reheat it for a minute. Grateful, Kelly promised that she would bring up the subject soon but first asked if they could talk. Gray put down the book, realizing that Dirk Pitt would have to wait. Gray's heart skipped a beat when he realized that Kelly wanted to tell him something important. Was it related to the conversation he was going to discuss with her? I want to get a free pass for this weekend, Gray, Kelly said doubtfully. Gray's thoughts raced as he sat on the couch, hoping he hadn't given away his shock. I'm sorry, he managed to ask, trying to make sense of her unexpected request. Kelly confirmed that Gray had heard her correctly and explained that she needed to spend the weekend with Johan Wegman to test her feelings. She assured Gray of her love for him, promising to return and spend the rest of her life proving it. Gray's stomach churned when he realized that Kelly had jeopardized their marriage with her request, but he made the decision that this tragedy should unfold to its conclusion. What if after this weekend you realize that once is not enough? What if you find that you need him for more than one weekend? What if you find out that you need him more than me? That's not going to happen, I promise, she quickly assured him. How can you make such promises, he asked. Twelve years ago, you promised me, you swore to leave everyone for me and now you break that promise so easily. She blushed and avoided his gaze. I need this, Gray, and I know that you love me enough to give it to me, she whispered. Let's be honest, Kelly. You may want this, but you don't need it. And you're hoping that I'll be stupid enough to give it to you. That's not going to happen, he repeated. But you don't own me, so if that's what you really want, then you can make your own choice. Remember, for every action, there is an equal reaction, Kelly, Gray reminded her. She thanked him, and he replied, There's no need to pretend that you misunderstood me. I want you to do what you think is right, and I will do the same. Kelly simply replied, Whatever you say. The next evening, Gray walked in the door and saw Kelly sitting at the kitchen table, drinking coffee. He noticed a small bag by the door and realized she had dressed for the evening in one of her most attractive dresses. She looked confident, and he commented, You seem confident in yourself. Kelly smiled coquettishly and replied, I'm confident in my husband. Gray raised an eyebrow in surprise. When Gray said goodbye to her and wished her a good weekend, Kelly felt his disappointment. She did not react to his unspoken emotions but smiled encouragingly. Gray's eyes reflected deep sadness as he spoke softly, expressing his love for her. With a heavy heart, he turned and headed upstairs leaving Kelly without a goodbye kiss. Immersed in thoughts of her upcoming date with Johan, Kelly felt excited, looking forward to their trip. She felt like a teenager looking forward to her first prom. Despite the difficulties in her marriage, Kelly and Johan decided to explore the new bond between them. As she walked to meet Johan in the hotel lobby, her heart pounded in anticipation of what the weekend would bring. Mr. and Mrs. Johan Beckman checked into their room and quickly freshened up before heading to dinner at a chic steakhouse. Before leaving, Johan asked Kelly to twirl for him, and unable to resist, 
he whistled admiringly before pulling her into a passionate kiss. Kelly couldn't help but think about how amazing he was at kissing. Their dinner was delicious, and each drank a bottle of wine, but only one, so as not to lose the thrill. For dessert, they had ice cream cones and engaged in intimate conversations, gently touching each other. To any outside observer, they seemed like a loving married couple. After dinner, they returned to their room, where leftover pizza sat on the table and empty beer bottles next to Gray's chair. Despite Gray being a skilled cook, he had chosen a simple pizza and beer, deeming it suitable for an evening when his wife would be with another man. After finishing his dinner, Gray went upstairs with several large garbage bags in his hands. He quickly gathered all of Kelly's clothes, casually tossing them into bags. When he was done, he carried the bags downstairs and left them by the front door. He handled jewelry and toiletries more carefully, placing them in a box by the door. Feeling satisfied and indescribably angry, Gray went downstairs, put a DVD of his favorite movie, Young Frankenstein by Mel Brooks, into the player, and sat down to watch. Kelly and Johan had just returned to their room when he kissed her passionately. She wrapped her arms around his neck, and they froze for a moment, lost in each other. We have two whole days, don't rush it, she whispered. They had been like this for several hours when Kelly finally got out of bed and headed for the shower. When she returned, Johan was already asleep. Kelly vowed not to compare him to Gray, knowing that her husband would not be able to compete with the new and exciting Johan. The next day, their adventures continued. On Saturday, the couple had a busy day planned with various activities, followed by another delicious dinner and intimate moments. Kelly hoped the previous night's meeting was just a one-time thing. Meanwhile, Gray spent the whole day alone, not even bothering to turn on the TV before dusk. Reflecting on his situation, he saw no way to save his marriage. He still loved his wife, but her recent disrespect had undermined his trust in her. Gray knew he would never be able to trust her again, especially after she asked for permission to be with someone else. As he sat in front of the TV watching a rerun of Leave it to Beaver, his thoughts drifted back to the happy times with Kelly. He took a sip of beer and pondered how they ended up where they were now, realizing their future was uncertain. Gray and Kelly were students at Arizona State University and attended several courses together. Gray was surprised to learn that the stunning girl from his class knew who he was, as she was always surrounded by a group of admirers. Despite this, she took the initiative to sit next to him in their ACC counting class and flirt with him. This led to her inviting him for coffee after class, to which he readily agreed. Their friendship blossomed into a romantic relationship that lasted through their college years and eventually led to marriage shortly after graduation. Gray had always considered their relationship strong, but recent events had made him doubt the strength of their bond. Lying next to her sleeping lover, Kelly reflected on how much she would have to do to atone for the mistakes she had made over the weekend. She could still hear the words her husband had said to her when she asked for a free pass, but she knew Gray loved her too much to put their marriage in jeopardy over a weekend affair. However, being with Johan, she unexpectedly found herself worrying about her husband. That Saturday evening, after a delightful day in the city, they made love not just once, but twice. Spending time with Johan was pleasant, he had a charming personality and impeccable manners. However, when they returned to their room on the second night, Johan's charm seemed to vanish as he became selfish and rude, leaving Kelly disappointed. She didn't even dare to call their encounters making love because they felt mechanical and devoid of intimacy. Johan's actions seemed careless and indifferent to her pleasure, leaving her conflicted and insecure. Disappointed in Johan, Kelly silently berated herself for her own foolishness. After a stuffy farewell and leisurely breakfast, Johan left the hotel with a satisfied smile while Kelly remained composed, exchanging passionate kisses with him in the parking lot before they both drove away. During the hour-long drive home, Kelly mentally prepared herself for the impending confrontation with her husband over her request for a free pass. Despite Gray's initial anger and threats, she was confident she could change his mind. If all else failed, she thought about resorting to seductive lingerie, stilettos, or even a leather bustier to win him over, a smirk on her lips as she considered how easily men could be manipulated. After parking the car in the garage, Kelly turned off the engine and quickly checked her makeup in the rearview mirror. Grabbing her bag from the back seat, she took a deep breath and confidently headed into the house. Hey, 
I'm home, she shouted upon entering the kitchen from the garage, expecting a warm welcome from Gray. However, when she heard the sound of the big screen TV in the living room, she was disappointed and annoyed by what she perceived as her husband's childish behavior. Kelly entered the living room and saw Gray sitting in an armchair, engrossed in a baseball game. He glanced at her briefly and returned his attention to the screen, seemingly ignoring her presence. Feeling hurt and disappointed, Kelly pouted and said, Is this how you're going to play it? Then, she stormed out of the room, leaving Gray to continue watching the game. Returning to the kitchen, Kelly noticed several packages at the front door and couldn't help but be curious. What the hell do all these bags at the front door mean? She shouted, getting no response from Gray. Deciding to investigate, she went to the packages and began opening one of them, trying to unravel the mystery Gray had left for her. He heard her gasp in shock, followed by the rustling sound of packages being opened. Damn it, this isn't funny, Gray. What the hell are you doing? She screamed. To make it easier for you to move out when I hand you the divorce papers, he replied, surprising her as he silently approached her. There will be no divorce, you idiot, she insisted. We talked about it. It's just one weekend. We've been married for 12 years. Of course you can give me one weekend. First of all, we didn't talk about it. You were talking, I was listening. You told me you were asking for permission to have an affair. When it was my turn to speak, I made it clear that I wasn't going to let that happen. It's not my fault that you didn't take me seriously, Gray explained. Are you seriously thinking of divorcing me because of one weekend? Out of all the time we've spent together and all the time we have ahead of us, she asked, panic creeping into her voice. We won't have a future together if you keep acting like this. I've made that clear to you. I'll do what I have to do. What exactly didn't you understand? Gray's voice was full of anger. Tears rolled from Kelly's eyes, and for the first time in their marriage, Gray made no move to comfort her. You cheated on me with another man. What you told me first doesn't negate the fact that it was cheating, especially after I explicitly told you not to do it, Gray accused. I never said that you can't make your own choices, but you also have to be prepared for the consequences of your actions. Kelly tried to justify herself, attempting to shift the blame. You only remember what suits you, Gray snapped. Kelly stood there, packing her things into bags, breathing heavily. I'm not leaving. This is my home too, she said defiantly. Of course, but since your things are already packed, you can move them to the guest room, Gray said coldly. I'll stay in the master bedroom. Okay, she grumbled, carrying the bags upstairs. Will you help me? she asked. I've already done my part by packing up, he replied, returning to watch the baseball game in the living room. Downstairs, Kelly sat on the couch, flipping through the Sunday newspaper loudly, trying to make noise with each turn of the page. Don't you want to ask me about my weekend? She pouted. Why would I want that? I guess you spend it with him, Gray replied. That's what cheaters do, right? We went out, did some sightseeing, and ate at nice restaurants she said with disappointment in her voice. Okay, well done, Gray replied. Maybe one of your girlfriends will be interested. Or your husband. Oh wait, that's not a husband anymore. Gray couldn't help but notice that his wife didn't look as excited as he'd expected, especially after all the fuss she'd made about her departure. The fact that she wanted to talk about an experience unrelated to making love made Gray wonder if Johan was more of a fling than a serious affair. But that's not his problem anymore, he thought. On Monday, Gray spent the day dealing with separating bank accounts and the financial aspects of their impending divorce. He knew he wouldn't be able to meet with the family law lawyer he dreamed of for another week, so he resigned himself to living in the same house with Kelly for a while longer. Meanwhile, Kelly spent the day avoiding Johan. She understood that they disagreed about the outcome of the weekend and realized that their relationship had irrevocably changed, and not for the better. Desperate for her husband to see this and come back to her, Kelly turned to Gray for help to fend off Johan's advances. Suddenly, Kelly's life became incredibly difficult as she debated whether to reconcile with Gray or move on as if nothing had happened. Kelly hoped her husband would eventually calm down, choosing the latter option as the easier one. She was afraid that her husband would call her a cheater again. After considering the situation from all sides, Kelly reluctantly admitted that the term cheater seemed more fitting than loving wife. 
With a heavy heart, she wondered if her perspective would have changed if the weekend had been successful instead of disappointing. When Gray came home from work, he greeted Kelly with silence that lasted until dinner. After finishing his meal, he quietly thanked Kelly and put his plate away. Kelly, feeling remorseful, whispered an apology. When Gray entered the living room, she said, After all this time, I believe that you loved me enough to give me a weekend off. Gray's response was sharp and stinging. Do I love you enough? I would have thought that after all these years, you'd love me enough not to ask for permission to cheat. The harsh reality of Gray's words made Kelly feel selfish and deluded. The next day at work, the situation seemed to worsen. Five minutes after Kelly entered her office, her best friend at the firm closed the door behind her, a rare occurrence in the office. Please tell me you didn't spend the weekend with Johan Wegman, Emma whispered. Despite the closed door, Kelly's eyes widened in shock. Was he bragging about it? No, Kelly, no. I overheard several girls gossiping about it in the break room while I was getting coffee. If they're whispering so early, the whole office will know about it by noon. There's no hiding it now, Emma said. Kelly buried her face in her hands, tears flowing onto her desk. I've become the woman every woman hates and every man wants. Was it worth it? She asked, arching her eyebrows. That's the biggest problem, isn't it? So I really upset my husband for what? She asked, shaking her head. Emma's shocked expression quickly turned to one of concern. How long do you think it will take to regain your husband's favor? I wish it were that simple, Kelly sighed. Gray talks about divorce all the time. We've been together for 12 years now, and he's constantly threatening to leave. He won't even agree to counseling. I thought he would just be angry, but he's beyond furious. I've never seen him so reckless. I warned him, but he didn't listen. Your caution doesn't matter now. You're an intelligent woman, and you can't deny that you knew the possible outcome, Emma said. The irony of fate was that Gray repeated almost the same words when, two weeks later, Kelly called him in tears after receiving the divorce papers at work. You said I could sleep with him. You said I could, she cried on the phone. No, I said it's your decision, but it will have consequences. I didn't give you permission to date that jerk, Gray replied. A couple of weeks later, Gray was contacted by relatives urging him to talk to their daughter and consider reconciliation. Despite his love for his relatives, Gray tried to gently refuse. She admits her mistake, but you won't listen to her. You won't even give her a chance to explain everything, his father-in-law reproached sternly. Gray shook his head at Ken's plea. She didn't tell you the whole story, Ken. I wouldn't call giving herself permission to sleep with a colleague over the weekend a mistake. I warned her there would be consequences, Gray said, sounding disappointed. Ken's shocked reaction only confirmed Gray's suspicions. No, no, she couldn't be that stupid. Ken shouted. Gray fell silent, realizing there was nothing more to say. I'm truly sorry. I don't know what else to say. I won't bother you anymore, Ken finally said, ending the conversation. The next day, Gray's heart skipped a beat when he saw Kelly's name on his phone screen. Another bout of guilt is on the way, he thought wearily. I'm sorry, Gray, that your father called you, Kelly's voice rang out. I admit I wasn't completely honest with my parents. It's not something you admit unless you have to. I didn't expect him to call, and I didn't think you'd betray me, she whispered. I didn't betray you. I just told the truth, he replied coldly. Yes, she sighed. Kelly and her lawyer attempted to postpone the divorce but Gray filed a lawsuit citing irreconcilable differences and the absence of children. Nine months later, Kelly couldn't believe Gray wouldn't give her another chance after what she called a mistake. The mistake wasn't just that you slept with another man, Kelly, he explained one night as she tried to change his mind. Long before you cheated, you were emotionally cheating on me. You've been neglecting my feelings and disrespecting me in the worst possible way. When did you stop loving me? Kelly fought back tears. One day, Gray attempted to comfort her while she cried. Why can't we try to reconcile? Yes, I still love you, Gray replied, his voice filled with pain. But I don't think you love me as much as I love you. Expressing his resentment and disbelief, Gray feared she would cheat again if another man caught her attention. 
She promised that there would be no second man, but Gray reminded her of the broken vows from their past during their divorce. Rumors spread about Kelly's affair with colleagues, which led to a meeting with the Human Resources Department. Although the company does not have an official policy prohibiting employee relationships, we expect them to use their discretion if rumors about personal lives cause disruption in the workplace. For instance, half of the male employees are discussing your weekend with Johan Wegman, while the other half of the women are speculating about your dating prospects. This is not a favorable situation. If the gossip doesn't cease, you may be asked to relocate to another office, the HR director mentioned. Mang is especially beautiful this time of year, she added. The next day, Johan approached Kelly again and asked her out on a date, despite the HR director's warning. She wasn't interested. Come on, your husband is divorcing you, Johan said, trying to convince her. We won't even have to leave town for the weekend, Kelly snapped. Can't you take a hint? I ruined my marriage for a meaningless fling with you that I never wanted. I was a fool. Now leave me alone. Two weeks later, after Kelly decided to move to North Carolina, rumors quickly spread throughout the company that Johan was not the charming ladies' man he had appeared to be. Just a month later, Johan transferred back to the Amsterdam office, where he continued to exude confidence and attractiveness. Kelly occasionally noticed him at the grocery store on Saturday mornings. He looked distant and unapproachable, though she usually managed to go unnoticed. Peggy, a fifth-grade teacher at a nearby elementary school, was content with her average appearance and physique. She didn't think she had anything special to attract a handsome, single man approaching her 30th birthday. Peggy had come to terms with the fact that she might remain single for the foreseeable future. She couldn't understand how an attractive man like the one she had recently met could still be single, especially since he looked about 30 years old and didn't appear to be a player. He seemed lost, possibly broken. Gray Penner didn't have a wedding ring on his left hand, but Peggy could tell he wasn't married without even checking. The contents of his cart revealed everything she needed to know about his relationship status. Pop-tart double-layered pies with filling and icing, frozen pizza, macaroni and cheese, beer, and grilled meat. It was evident he was living the bachelor life. Peggy, whom many called unassuming, had short, wavy, light brown hair, large brown eyes, and nearly pale skin. Standing at 5 feet 6 inches, she had medium-sized breasts, decent legs, and her favorite feature was a muscular, rounded back. Her college friends considered her the perfect companion for her friendliness, dedication, and average looks. A few months earlier, she had first noticed Gray when passing by. She couldn't explain why, but she kept noticing him more and more over time. She began to pay attention to him, even though it wasn't like her. Maybe I should introduce myself, she thought. I'll just do it. A few weeks later, Peggy approached the man with a bold proposition. I know this may seem forward, but I'm Peggy Scanlon. Would you like to have a cup of coffee with me? Gray took a step back, studying the woman who had just spoken to him. She might not be as dazzling as Kelly, but there was something captivating in her gaze that intrigued him. It was as if there was a hidden depth in her that he wanted to uncover. For the first time in years, Gray found himself genuinely intrigued by a woman. Yes, I think that would be great, he replied without hesitation. Peggy Scanlon was a mystery waiting to be solved. Besides, she was quite transparent. Despite being 29 years old, she had very little dating experience and had never been in a serious relationship. She won him over with her intelligence and sophistication. Telling the story of her life, Peggy finished speaking and fell silent, waiting for his reaction. After studying his eyes, she concluded that he must be divorced, sensing the lingering pain of a broken heart. Watching him think deeply, she couldn't help but wonder about his own story. Watching him, she noticed he seemed conflicted about how much to reveal about himself. Despite the internal struggle, he continued to share almost all the details of his story, and she listened attentively. When he finished, a heavy silence filled the room as they both absorbed the weight of his words. He took a deep breath and looked at her with a sense of relief, as if a burden had been lifted from his shoulders. I apologize for dumping all this on you, he confessed, meeting her gaze. You're the first person I've told my story to. I guess I have that effect on people, she remarked. I also get along great with small children and dogs, 
Gray laughed in response. He felt strangely at ease with this stranger, reminiscent of how he had felt with Kelly in the past before they broke up. Gray offered to set up a date for the following Friday evening. It was on the third date that they finally made love. Peggy tried to hold back but eventually succumbed to Gray's temptation. There was something undeniably attractive about Gray's calm demeanor despite the lack of overt courtship. She couldn't resist his charm. After a delicious dinner at a Hungarian restaurant, Gray invited Peggy to have coffee and join him at his apartment. When they settled into a cozy two-seater armchair in the living room, Peggy couldn't resist leaning over to kiss Gray on the lips. Soon they were in each other's arms, throwing off their inhibitions and clothes. Heading to Gray's bedroom, Peggy let out a high-pitched scream and fell motionless. Gray got out of bed and spent the next hour making gentle love to her. At that moment, he realized that this was the first time he had been close to someone since the divorce. The rest of the time, they were engaged in frank intimacy. During their intimate moments, he made sure to kiss her after they stopped. She snuggled up to him and whispered, What are you going to do in the next few decades? He replied, Hush, it's okay. We'll have plenty of time to talk later. Peggy smiled wearily at him as he gently pressed his lips to hers. Having been a bridesmaid four times a year earlier, the woman finally found herself in the spotlight. She and her husband had two children, a boy two years after the wedding and a girl two years later. Peggy, unlike those before her, always remembered her vows. And although Gray would never know about it, Kelly would always remember this lesson. After moving to North Carolina, she remarried and remained faithful to her second husband for 15 years until she discovered his infidelity. Realizing the pain Gray had gone through, she quickly made the decision to divorce her second husband. Despite the fact that Kelly was already over 50, she continued to exercise and take care of herself, remaining an attractive woman. Once unmarried and approaching the age of 50, she had never imagined such a situation, especially considering that her second husband was 10 years older and did not want to have children. It was too late to change anything now. She knew that there were many 30-year-old men eager to impregnate her, but none of them were interested in becoming more than just a casual partner for her. The thought made her grin, almost bordering on barking. Gray imagined a family with two children, and she dreamed of three. If everything had gone according to plan, their three children would now be teenagers, and she and Gray would have been completely immersed in their lives, school events, social outings, sports games, musical performances, parental difficulties, graduations both from school and college. All this was just around the corner, weddings and grandchildren followed. And now it's all gone for the sake of fleeting intimacy. How stupid she felt, perhaps for the thousandth time. She shook her head sadly. If she were plucky enough, she would kick herself in the ass. A few months later, Gray and Peggy Penner appeared on the other side of the country with their 15-year-old son, Reggie. The couple sat in the high school gym and watched their daughter, Phyllis, receive her diploma at the age of 18. Peggy gently squeezed her husband's hand, and they exchanged a look filled with happy tears. Gray bent down to kiss his wife on the lips, which made their son wince with teenage embarrassment. Enough of this, you too. Not here or not now, he complained. His parents giggled, exchanged smiles, and then raised their eyebrows at each other.